Man, maybe 40 here. So I don't know if you saw the 1989 movie, A Cry in the Dark. It was about Michael and Lindy Chamberlain, Seventh-day Adventist pastor and his wife, who lost a baby at Ayers Rock, now known as Uluru. A dingo took my baby. And they were accused of sacrificing their baby. Like the baby Azaria is supposed to mean, you know, a sacrifice in the wilderness. And the fear and contempt and hatred for the Chamberlains who didn't, didn't do anything wrong came in large part because Seventh-day Adventists are not popular in Australia because they set themselves apart keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath by being religious, right? Australia is overwhelmingly a secular society. By being vegetarian, like being a vegetarian, socially it makes you less popular than child molesters. And just being un-Australian, right? Who are these religious weirdos? So the more you separate yourself from the majority, the more you distinguish yourself and differentiate yourself from everyone else, like in general, the less popular you're going to be. So, the stronger your sense of identity, right? The better off you'll generally be in life. And if you have a clear identity, right, you know who your community is, right? If it's a primarily a racial identity or a religious identity or a cultural identity, tribal identity, and most people do better off with a strong identity. So, this is the lovely Sydney Opera House. Australia is playing at 6 a.m. tomorrow against France. So, this uh, Argentina. They all excited about the World Cup. So people who have like one foot in, one foot out of a religious identity, communal identity, cultural identity, racial identity, you think that they would uh, they would struggle? Right? It's easier to have a strong racial, religious, cultural, national identity. But uh, some people are very strong and flexible. They, they see the advantages in their mixed identity. But generally speaking, you know, the more guardrails you have in life, the better off you do. So some people in mixed race struggle. And they don't know if they're white or Asian. And they feel like they belong to either group. This is Argentina, right? Yeah, Lionel Messi, it must be Argentina. They're ready to win the World Cup. They have to be one of the favorites. And I could hear them across the harbor. So, I think about the collective energy that they're gaining. Right? They're singing together, chanting together, moving together. Right? You build up tremendous energy, just like marching together. Right? You'll build up tremendous energy. Diego Maradona, a great soccer star for Argentina. Right? When you're able to create a shared reality together, it's incredibly powerful. A tremendous source of energy. So I know a lot of people say, oh, I, don't, I don't like community, it's too stifling but there are just reservoirs of energy that are available if you're able to connect and create a shared reality. If you get on the same page with other people, just marching together, you get filled with energy that you won't have just on your own. If you march together and sing together and dance together and eat together and uh, support a team together, all right? Walk together, sleep together, run together, dance together. Right? This is uh, 
Argentina fans getting ready for the World Cup. Oh man, they're really hitting the peak now. I think they're ready for the World Cup. And that's why people want to go to sports bars and share a collective communal experience because it unlocks an emotional intensity and energy that's just not available otherwise. Magnificent Sydney Opera House. If you can share this experience two, three, five, ten times as intense as if you just do it on your own. Right? You can say the morning prayers in Judaism, you can say them on your own, but if you can say them with a community, all right, you form bonds and you bond with people and you create a shared experience together. There's always an ethic that comes out of it. This is uh, Randall Collins, sociologist, his insight in his great classic work, Interactual Interaction Ritual Chains. Sydney, I love you, I love you. get on the same page with other people just create something together man there's a whole new experience that's available to you a whole new strength and energy you can accomplish things you could never accomplish on your own right people who get inspired by a national religious ideal you go on to commit acts of you know superhuman strength where do they get that energy like the great CEOs, the great generals, the great political leaders. Right? They get that energy because they get on the same page with other people. And through the interactions, as they go through the day, they get more and more energy. As they get on the same page, they create a shared reality. Right? They tune into other people. Right? They get into a rhythm with other people. And then with every interaction, they're building energy and strength how you accomplish great things and you build build something with other people so you start your day at synagogue right you say the morning prayers right and you're getting charged up by seeing your friends then you go to work you say good morning to the secretary you say good morning to your co-workers you share a little bit about the night before or the weekend you start talking about plans for the day. You know, tasks ahead. You know, common dreams. All right, you're getting on the same page with others. You're tuning in to people. So you're noticing, oh wow, it looks like you had a tough weekend. Or show a little bit of empathy to others. Like, you look really happy today. Or, you know, why is there such a bounce in your stride today? What's that big broad smile I see? Or what's going on? You seem sad. Right? You tune into other people, you get on the same page with other people. Right? And then you create a shared reality. People like people who notice them. Right? People like people who notice their you know, emotional state, who don't solely interact with people on instrumental bases, but instead and you know, just notice, wow, you know, there's something going on with you. I remember I was working in construction. It was absolutely brutal work, but the most brutal part of it was the dehumanization. Like I was just a cog in the, in the machine. I was just swinging a pick, using a shovel, you know, creating ditches to lay PVC pipe. And uh, I just felt like you know, just another cog in the machine. And it was absolutely brutal. And then I worked for a guy, Doug Hanslick, real estate developer. And he noticed me. He was the first person to notice me. He said, oh, you're Australian. 
my daughter wants to go to Australia. Right? That human connection, I can notice my humanity, notice my Aussiness, notice my accent. Right? Notice something about me, I wasn't just a, a cog in the machine. I just made all the difference and I went from hating the job to loving the job. Right? I remember when I was working in landscaping and I just, you know, much of the time I just felt you know, ignored and I don't know, just like I was some grubby, 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 dirty guy. And there's times when people would notice, you know, there's something about me. They, they just give me a little bit of individual attention. I don't recognize my humanity. It's made all the difference in my energy level, my enthusiasm level, and how I felt about myself. Whether I felt good or bad. Like just someone tuning in a little bit to what was going on with me, someone who paid a little bit of attention to, to me. Right? I got new energy, new enthusiasm for my work, new commitment to quality, doing good work new level of interest in my work said that I even dropped out of college largely in my fall of uh, 1986 I so enjoyed working for Doug Hanslick I think Dominion Enterprises that uh, so enjoyed running a landscaping crew as a foreman that uh, I dropped my schedule from 18 units to 6 units because I was feeling fed by being in landscaping like I felt noticed I felt Appreciated, you know, I felt special, I felt important. I was getting fed, creating a communal sense. And then the winter set in, it was absolutely miserable. And I returned to school with a whole new dedication and just, just started pulling nothing but A's after that. I took 21 units, got straight A's for the first time in my life. I finally got serious about my education because of the brutal fall and winter of 1986. So, and the spring semester rolled around in January 1987. I was serious, 21 units, straight A's, got accepted into UCLA. So uh, getting fed a little bit can also distort you if you're that needy, and I guess I was that emotionally needy. Right? So I'm just paying a little bit of attention to you. It can have an intoxicating effect. Like if you're, you're just emotionally parched, like you're a man dying of thirst in the desert and someone recognizes you and shows you a little bit of kindness uh, that can have an intoxicating effect and knock you off course and uh, you can give you know, too much weight to you know, what are trivial uh, work relationships you can Allow it to distort your thinking. Don't you forget what is, what is important. Like human connections are powerful. One of the most powerful intoxicants. So Vance Joy was rehearsing on Friday. You think they have energy? <laughs> I think they found some emotional energy there. <laughs> 